everyone. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you very much, Andrew, back in the uh, I guess salmon bosom of the FT. It's a real pleasure. I miss the place horrendously. The 10 years at uh, Lex and at the FT were the happiest of my professional career. So it's a real joy to be back. Um, you probably don't expect a uh, speech title like this at a conference like this. Um, I do have a beard, which is one, my one sop to responsible investing. Um, but I can happily say that I'm probably the only head of responsible investing worldwide at a major bank who has never used the word journey, either in print um, or up on stage. And I take a very, very um, financial and investment view of the topic. And um, it's only 20 minutes till coffee. And uh, what I'm going to do over the next course of the 10 slides is to say why I completely disagree with the presentation that Sharon from Deloitte gave a couple of presentations ago and why climate risk, um, climate change is not a financial risk that we need to worry about. Heresy. I completely get that there is a competition for funding. I completely get that at the end of your central bank career, there are still many, many years to fill in. You've got to say something. You've got to fly around the world to conferences. You've got to out hyperbole the next guy. But I feel like it's getting a little bit out of hand. The constant reminder that we are doomed, the constant reminder that within decades, it's all over. And indeed, Sharon said, we are not going to survive. And indeed, no one ran from the room. In fact, most of you barely looked up from your mobile phones at the prospect of non-survival. It's become so hyperbolic that no one really knows how to get anyone's attention at all. Now, I wouldn't normally mind that. 25 years in the finance industry, there's always some nut job telling me about the end of the world. I've dealt with gold bugs my whole financial career. The roof's going to cave down. Y2K, does anyone remember Y2K? Anyone old enough? The lifts didn't stop. But what bothers me about this one is the amount of work these people make me do. The amount of regulation coming down the pipes, the number of people in my team and at HSBC dealing with financial risk from climate change. Last night, Target fell 25%. 25%. And people are asking the board of US companies to spend time dealing with climate risk. I work at a bank that's being attacked by crypto, We've got regulators in the US trying to stop us. We've got the China problem. We've got a housing crisis looming. We've got interest rates going up. We've got inflation coming down the pipes. And I'm being told to spend time and time again looking at something that's going to happen in 20 or 30 years. Hence, the proportionality is completely out of whack. Now, interestingly, at the moment, markets agree more or less, with me, despite the hyperbole, and this is a fun slide I put up just to annoy people, the more people say the world is going to end, and here I've looked at the number of incidences in all press around the world that use climate catastrophe, the number of times the phrase climate catastrophe is mentioned around the world, the higher and higher and higher risk assets go. In tandem, the more we're doomed, the higher prices go. How, how is that possible? What, so what's going on then? The Sharons and the Mark Carneys of this world need to tell us why prices are going up with our own demise. And there's really only three answers that are possible to, to old purists like me. Either the risk is negligible, which for investors is great. We get on with everything and fine. So no problem there. Maybe it's in the price. It's perfectly feasible that every single investor in the market, and there are millions of them, we all went to school and learnt about um, um, pricing theory, maybe it's in the price. In which case, if we solve climate risk, markets are going to boom. And that's also fantastic for investors. Or the Mark Carneys of this world have to convince us all, including me, that every single one of us on climate risk is wrong. Every one of us. That's possible, but it's a big call to make. The first argument they often give is that it's going to hurt future growth. 
and we've all now seen the Kaya identity and we're all talking about GDP, et cetera, et cetera. And the common argument even used um, by the um, IPCC is that it's going to hit GDP in year number whatever it is, 2100. It's a long way away. They reckon it's going to lop off 2.5%. Their worst case models lops off 5 what they fail to tell everybody, of course, is between now and 2100, economies are going to grow a lot. At about 2%, it's the red bar. At about 3%, it's the black bar. But the world is going to be between 500 or 1,000% richer. 1,000%. If you lop 5% off that in 2100, who cares? You will never notice. Two years ago, GDP growth stopped. It was minus infinity. It was okay, mostly all right. Europe has a GDP per capita 40% lower than the US. Northern Europe, it's okay. 5% in the year 2100 is more or less irrelevant. But that wealth is important because adaption is going to be a key reason why not only the financial implications are going to be de minimis, that the actual lifestyle implications will be de minimis as well. Most people put up the charts of hurricanes and floods and they go up. What they don't often put up are charts of the number of people who die from catastrophes, the amount of losses as a proportion of GDP or output. Anything where you actually put a denominator on those statistics tend to look like that. Human beings have been fantastic at adapting to change, adapting to climate emergencies, and we will continue to do so. Who cares if Miami is six meters underwater in a hundred years? Amsterdam's been six meters underwater for ages, and that's a really nice place. We will cope with it. California's fire budget, and I don't doubt the science at all, there will be fires but we do need to adapt. Their fire budget is only 1% of their state budget. It's 0.1% of their GDP. If economic growth continues how I expect it to grow, we can solve this through adaption. And one of the tragedies of um, this whole debate, and which is what we obsess about at HSBC, is we spend way too much on mitigation financing and not enough on adaption financing. And I'm sure most of you will agree with that. The other big problem that the Marks and Sharons have is this confusion between volume and value. And anyone who's run money or who anyone's been an analyst knows this very well, but the climate community doesn't. There is a big difference between falling volumes and a falling price. Many things have to happen in between. Volumes can fall, revenues may fall, but that doesn't mean profits do. It doesn't mean cash flows do. We don't know how industries are going to respond. We don't know what companies are going to do with capex. We don't know what's going to happen with all the other things that affect companies in between those two things. What happens to absolute and relative prices at the end of this process is completely divorced from the transition winners and losers. My point being that there will be Winners whose share prices or values go up and down. There'll be losers whose share prices go up and down. And what we do is we spend a lot of time looking at, these is pretty cool, right? It even looks like the HSBC logo. Did you get that? So these are volumes. So these are you know, coal companies, industrials, cement companies. They're going to see falling volumes. Of course they are. And there'll be sorts of companies that see rising volumes, renewables, all that sort of good technological stuff. But both of them, some will destroy value, some will create value, and it will depend on their, um, on, on their capex, what they pay out. It will depend on all the things that we learned at university on what drives share prices. And it's very, very possible to build portfolios around both winners and losers. And we mustn't forget that at all. And we see that all the time. I've just pulled this up randomly. This is the a global renewables index versus coal. And at the moment, coal is shooting the lights out. Renewables is having a bit of a wobble and that will reverse. And that's the way the world has been for hundreds of years. But don't tell me that renewables is going to outperform coal forever because there'll be lots and lots of factors that change that dynamic. 
Another thing I often hear is, oh, what about stranded assets? And oh, my goodness gracious me. What matters is those stranded assets versus the value of the underlying business. Take something very simple like a PE. What happens when you buy something on 10 times that is not growing, all you analysts? You are basically getting your money back after 10 years of earnings per share, right? You are paying 10 years worth of earnings per share for a company. So let's imagine, for the sake of the argument, that that is the earnings per share profile of, of, of your industry. And then Sharon is right, the world ends and the bars go, go deep red at the end. For most companies with stranded assets, and even for tech, their valuation does not take into account anything that happens after about year 20. At a big bank like ours, at HSBC, what do people think the average loan length is? It's six years. What happens to the planet in year seven is actually irrelevant to our loan book. For coal, what happens in year seven is more or less irrelevant. Now, the smarter ones will know, among you will know, for a growth company, there's a terminal value and all of that sort of stuff. But in general, these sorts of companies aren't growing very fast. So the debate about what happens out here from a financial risk perspective, it's irrelevant. Don't care. Now, I completely agree with the panelists' um, uh, in the question in the survey before me on, up here about the one thing that I think is could be a risk out of the blue and I go back to those smiley faces the one thing the market could get wrong is a whopping great carbon tax out of the blue 200 bucks wham put that in your model okay that that is possible but a lot of people smarter than me have already been starting to think about this particularly central banks now, central banks are particularly annoying because they haven't spent enough time looking, worrying about inflation and growth and why it's going out of control and spent way too much time on, on climate risk. If you look at their publications, and I beg you to do this, Bank of England, particularly the Dutch, go right to the back in the small print when they do their climate stress tests. Right to the back. They will put a whopping great policy shock into their model. And you go, oh, okay, that sounds a bit bad. Oh my goodness, that's gonna wipe off. In fact, it's only gonna wipe off about 5% of bank asset prices. But then you look at the sensitivities of what they've done. The first thing they do is they absolutely trash GDP growth. Minus one, minus three, minus three again, minus, that's never happened in my life, that's never happened ever. More fun is they do, this is and across all the scenarios, what they've done is a gigantic interest rate shock. All the Bank of England and central bank scenarios on climate risk to get a nasty number, they have given the financial sector a whopping great interest rate shock, and they never talk about it. It's all in the back of all the documents. You can read it. Very easy to make a bank look sick if you destroy their fixed income portfolio, and that's what they do. So even with a carbon tax, even hitting growth, they couldn't make climate risk move the needle. So they had to get their clever little wonks in the back room to put a gigantic interest rate shock through their models in order to make headlines. That is not reported very much either. But my final point, I guess, is an optimistic one. It's just before coffees. Everybody so far that I've listened to this morning has been quite doom laden. Humans are spectacularly good at managing change. That is the long run return of the S&P 500. That includes two world wars, that includes an oil crisis, that includes a financial crisis, that includes the pandemic. It goes up and up and up and it will continue to rise at 6.5% real for as long as um, toast is toast. And the climate change won't change that either. Imagine you were in 1920 or 1930 or whenever this chart began. And we're at this conference and somebody said, Stuart, what do you think the effect on growth will be of carbon emissions over the next 100 years? And I'd get out my model, actually if I'd bring my team into the room and go, okay, well, there's a lot of gas guzzling cars, there are a lot of ships, there's a lot of industry, that doesn't look very good. And we know that that goes into people's lungs. And we would put together a really, really nasty outlook for today from what we knew in 1930, we would never have understood 
the deindustrialization. We would never have understood the rise of the service economy. We would never have understood how GDP is getting lighter. We would never understand how machinery is getting more efficient. Likewise, we do have no idea what the next 50, 100 years are going to bring. But I can promise you in 100 years when my great-great-grandson stands up and pulls up that chart, it will look more or less the same. The log pattern will hold. And all I do is beg people in this room not to be so negative around returns. The markets are crashing around our ears today and yesterday for nothing to do with climate whatsoever. I implore our leaders and our regulators most of all, because I spend way too much time at work dealing with this, to show some perspective. And let's get back to making money out of the transition because there are thousands of opportunities out there. We have a trillion dollar car company that nobody at the FT predicted five years ago, including myself. And um, they're the sort of opportunities we need to invest in all around the world. I agree in the just transition. I agree with the opportunities that exist in all these facets of technology, but it's a good thing. It's nothing to be ashamed or scared about. I rest my case. Enjoy your coffee. Thank you very much.